welcome everybody to the Aortic Hematology Oncology Research Group webinar, part one. Please note that questions can be put forward to our panelists in the chat box. Questions will be answered after each presentation, time permitting. Our first panelist is Dr. Christopher Williams. Dr. Christopher Williams is a hematologist and a medical oncologist who is board certified in Canada and the United States, where he has held academic appointments, as well as in Ibadan, Nigeria, where he taught and researched from 1978 to 1988. He co-founded Aortic in 1982 and founded Aortic Hog in 2010. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and a member of the Center for AIDS Research at the University of Washington, Seattle, Washington, United States. He lives in Victoria, Canada. Over to you, Dr. Williams. You may start your presentation. Can you hear me, everybody? Uh, now, let me get this out here. Now, uh, now let me start by thanking uh, AstraZeneca for agreeing to host our uh, webinars uh, on their media platform. I think this is a very uh, important gesture and hope, hopefully it would uh, contribute uh, to the development of aortic as we go along. I also would like to thank uh, the uh, uh, members of staff of the aortic uh, office in Cape Town, uh, led by uh, Mrs. Bermira Rodrigue and Ms. Sky uh, uh, Wilson for your part in setting up this uh, webinar. Uh, um, as uh, the moderator has already said, uh, this is uh, a kind of a research uh, gathering for us here in, in uh, aortic hematology oncology research group but we're very happy that uh, we'll be able to you might we might be able to uh, uh, recruit more members of uh, uh, aortic to join us uh, in our uh, endeavors in uh, aortic uh, chart to try to uh, discuss cancer research I and mean, uh, research in hematological malignancies as we go along. Uh, with that, I would like to proceed with my presentation here. And uh, now the objectives of, uh, of, of uh, what we're going to try to do is to, at least for today, we'll be discussing the history of uh, cancer research in Africa and um, we were talking about what people uh, who were ahead of me actually did in the past. And also to some extent what I also did when I was in Nigeria. And uh, the hope is that we will be able to demonstrate to the present generation of uh, uh, cancer care scientists and doctors in Africa that uh, they can actually repeat what happened in the past and perhaps even do much better than what I'm going to talk to you about. And, and, uh, and also we'll be discussing how we're going, we might be able to work to get to make progress in this respect. So it's often difficult to talk with younger people of today about, about uh, 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 the past of cancer research in Africa, that, that, is, that, that there was at one time uh, what we can refer to as, um, as an era of uh, the golden age of cancer research in Africa because of all the chaos that is now going on, you know, not only in Africa, but all over the world. But indeed, there was a, a golden age of cancer research in Africa, and it occurred between the 1950s and, uh, and this, uh, 1970s, mainly in, in uh, uh, University of Makerere in, in uh, Kampala, Uganda, and University of Ibadan. Now, at that time, there was a lot of uh, I would say, you know, unhappiness about uh, the state of cancer 
all the whole world. I mean, it, it, it was a universal uh, uh, phenomenon. Nothing was known about cancer. And it happened to have been, it was a time that uh, Americans were getting frustrated with the idea of cancer. And if, if, uh, a lot of people were dying of the disease and people didn't know what was going on. So there was a, almost a political movement in, uh, in, in in a place like New York City, there was uh, a lady by the name uh, Mary Laska who actually made it into a political movement that the cure to cancer had to be found. And just about that time, a disease was discovered in Africa, uh, in African children that turned out to have been Beckett's lymphoma. And not only that, the, the disease was... Uh, proven to be uh, curable with very simple measures. And so that gave uh, Americans and uh, other people in the world uh, a lot of hope that uh, cancer did not need to be something that was totally uh, uh, frustrating and that something could be done about it. And uh, so Places like uh, Makere Ray uh, University in Kampala and the University of Ibadan, where Berkeley's lymphoma was being reasonably well managed, became like uh, the, the, the makers and medinas of, uh, of the cancer world. You know, young people, younger people with ideas who wanted to learn about cancer went to uh, these places. And among them were people like uh, the Porvitats, the you know, John Ziegler, who went to uh, Uganda. And in Nigeria, you had uh, people like uh, Oshukoya, uh, uh, Femi Williams, Luzato. And so uh, that is what I refer to as the, you know, the golden age of cancer research in Africa. Um, so what did uh, these individuals do? They, for instance, the uh, Bacchus lymphoma was described during this period of time, and it turned out to have been uh, the first uh, example of the uh, influence of, uh, of, of, uh, of the environment in, in, in the causation of cancer. And, now, what they did was actually to take pictures of uh, uh, children with Bacchus lymphoma, and they went all over uh, various hospitals in West Africa, East Africa, South Africa, and showing people, you know, do you see this kind of disease here? And people said yes or no. And with that, they were able to come out with this diagram here, so this map showing that Bacchus lymphoma occurred uh, in, a, in a belt that coincided with the malaria uh, belt uh, in, in Africa. And that was uh, how Becker's lymphoma was described as uh, one of the, uh, as, as the, one of the examples of uh, geographical pathology. And uh, after that, uh, cell lines were created from Becker's lymphoma cells, uh, obtained from African children and given African names like Raji and Dowdy. All over the world today, you go to laboratories and you hear of cell lines called Raji and nobody actually knew what those, that, that meant. But these were African names, actually Nigerian names uh, that were given to these cell lines. This, uh, the study of this cell lines led to the discovery of, uh, uh, of the MIG gene, which was the beginning of uh, molecular biology. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus was discovered in association with Bacchus lymphoma. And the principles of cancer chemotherapy were actually described in association with the studies of Bacchus lymphoma. So the idea that cancer is curable, actually developed from the studies of Bacchus lymphoma, the advancement of the concept of curability of cancer. Now, 
One of the very bright people that came to Africa during this period was uh, uh, Lucio Luzzato, a young uh, uh, Italian uh, uh, hematologist who had gone to the United States to do studies in hematology. And then after that, uh, went to Ibadu, Nigeria and uh, became very interested in red cell enzymes, especially glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, we call it GSSPD, and was interested in the uh, genetic link of uh, uh, that enzyme uh, to uh, demonstrate an X-linked disease linked to the sex chromosome. And uh, it happened that African women uh, have two different types of like, glucose phosphate dehydrogenase, unlike people in the West, or, you know, Western women. So uh, they, they have uh, the A type of GSSB and B type GSSB, as a result of which, uh, uh, as a result of what we call lionization and all that kind of thing, you, you end up with uh, uh, a mosaic. Uh, picture uh, of uh, red cells in, in, the, in the peripheral blood in respect of uh, uh, the GSSPD phenotype of Nigerian women. And Lucio Luzzati was able to use this concept to show that in a disease called parosis monoctonal hemoglobinuria, uh, that the abnormal red cells were monoclonal. And that was used as an evidence for the existence of a pluripotent stem cell. And now this was a very important observation at that time because uh, prior to that time, there was not much evidence that the, uh, the human cells uh, had anything like a you know, pluripotent uh, uh, origin, like uh, what Lucci was able to show. Now that paper was published in, in blood but back in the 1970s by, by Oni Oshunkoya and Luzato. And the, the publication actually put Ibadan you know, on the world map, uh, you know, uh, as uh, uh, something that could be done um, uh, in on the very, very simple and primitive conditions, actually, you know, using uh, a start gel electrophoresis, very, very simple methods. I, I would recommend that this paper be read by every hematologist uh, anywhere. As a matter of fact, as a, mat, uh, as a result of this uh, uh, investigation, Lucio Luzato became, I, I would say, well famous. Uh, now, Shortly after the pub publication of this paper, Sir John Daisy, who was more or less the, uh, the Pope of hematology in those days, retired and he was succeeded as head of hematology at Hammersmith Hospital by, uh, by Lucio Rosato. Rumor has it that uh, his appointment was not unconnected to this unique uh, investigations that he was able to carry out in Ibadan. So this, in my view, should be an example for uh, people who are in, uh, in Africa today to realize that you can do a lot of good things with very, very simple methods, something as simple as stag gel electrophoresis uh, can give you very uh, interesting outcome of the studies. Now, in the 70s or the 50s to 70s, the best news of, about cancer, as I said earlier, used to come from Uganda. Apart from Belkis lymphoma, they studied other conditions, they studied hepatocellular carcinoma and Kaposi sarcoma. And um, now, Endemic Kaposi sarcoma in the 50s and, and 60s uh, was considered to be a disease that was totally, uh, you know, restricted to Africa. And the rest of the world was not interested. As a matter of fact, 
in the 60s and early 70s, people in uh, Uganda were trying to find funds to be able to carry out studies in Kaposi sarcoma. And they couldn't get the Americans to help them. And, uh, and in spite of that, they went on and did some very interesting work. And lo and behold, just a decade after that, HIV broke out in, uh, in America, in Los Angeles, and New York City. And Kaposi sarcoma became a, uh, one of the hallmarks of HIV. And so everybody became very interested in Kaposi sarcoma. And the methodologies that were developed for the management of Kaposi sarcoma in Uganda became the standard of care in the West. And that lasted until relatively recently. So now the products of the golden age of cancer research in Africa were among the proofs that were presented to somebody like President Nixon uh, by a panel of people we now refer to as the consultants for the con conquest of cancer, uh, who made the argument to Nixon that money had to be invested in cancer research. And, uh, and that is what led to the U.S. National Cancer Act of 1971 being signed into law uh, under the pressures of people like uh, uh, Mary Lasko, as I said earlier. Now that law is what subsequently led to the massive funding of cancer research that has now transformed uh, our global understanding of cancer as it is today. Uh, Now, you would then wonder, people ask me, well, if there was a time like this, or a time of excellence in cancer research in Africa, what then happened? Well, by the beginning of the 1970s, the process of unraveling of excellence of cancer uh, had already started because people who did all this work started to leave Africa. You know, the 70s was the the period immediately after uh, the end of the colonial rule in, uh, in various uh, uh, countries of Africa, French countries and, and in, uh, English uh, you know, ruled countries became free. And you know, expatriate workers who had contributed to cancer research in Africa started to leave. And in addition, the massive funding of institutions outside Africa as a result of the declaration of war against cancer had led uh, Africa in, uh, in, in the ditch, you know, because Africa could no longer, you know, match the, uh, the, 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 you know, the trend of funding that was going on elsewhere. In addition, there were problems within Africa itself as I said earlier, departure of first patriot colonial science, a failure of uh, the newly independent countries to continue to show interest in cancer research. And somebody like Idi Amin actually went and closed down the cancer center in Kampala. And as a result of, it, uh, of what was going on, even indigenous African scientists who were doing very good work in cancer research at that time. Uh, we left Africa and the process that we now refer to as brain drain, some people say brain flight, uh, as a result of all the chaos that was going on in Africa in the, in the 70s. Uh, the wars of uh, uh, Southern Africa, in the mili mil military takeovers in West Africa, so absolute chaos, and that. Then something happened in uh, early 1980s. There was this conference that uh, the UITC meeting that was held in Seattle, uh, Washington, just. Uh, close to where I'm living right now. And uh, 
four people who were attending that conference had a common bond, bond among them. That led to a meeting that was held during a, you know, a, a lunch break of the conference. We had uh, with us uh, Ungu, whose picture is shown here, uh, the uh, right lower panel here. Ungu uh, had done a lot of work in the slim format. Uh, in this fifties uh, to seventies, and as a matter of fact, he had been given uh, the so-called Laska Award uh, one year after the declaration of war uh, against cancer. And so now, for people who don't know what Laska Award is, it's like the American Nobel Prize in medicine. So Ungo was one of the first to be given that prize because of the work he did in Berkeley's lymphoma in Africa. Next to him here, the left lower panel, uh, is uh, James Holland. Uh, James Holland took got the uh, Laska Award uh, for actually for plastic leukemia. He had done a lot of work to find a cure uh, for acutely for plastic leukemia, which was a very major killer of uh, children in developed countries. And uh, upper left panel here is Shulanke, who, uh, who was a professor of surgery in Nigeria. And he was, at the time that I was there, the president of the Nigerian Cancer Society. And I was the baby of the group. And uh, I had just joined the staff in about 1978. And who, he took me on and I became secretary of the cancer, uh, of the Nigerian Cancer Society. And just that is how all the four of us met. Now, I had trained on the James Holland in New York, in New York City, uh, from 1975 to 1978. And we had become very, very good friends. So there was a connection between all of us. And we met at this meeting in Seattle and decided that something needed to be done to bring back uh, uh, the excellence of cancer research uh, that had already collapsed to bring it back to Africa. And that was how we created the organization, the uh, African Organization for Research and Training in Cancer, they called the AOTIC. Uh, now, Unku was from Cameroon, although he was, uh, had done most of his work in Nigeria. And uh, he, uh, the Cameroon is a bilingual country. Uh, and uh, he, he came from the English, became part of, uh, of Cameroon. But he insisted that AOTIC should be bilingual. So we got the name of uh, Organisation Africaine pour la Recherche l'Ensonnement sur le Cancer, OREC as the translation of AIRD. And the goals of, uh, of the organization right from the beginning was to bring back the uh, cancer research excellence back to Africa as it was before. As I was the youngest person in the group, I was asked to be the secretary general uh, of, the, of the new organization. Uh, Victor Ungu became chairman of AIRD and the uh, uh, chairman of the organizing committee for the organization was uh, Shulanke, and James Holland became the scientific uh, advisor for the organization. Now, as I said earlier, uh, the now we've got something. No, sorry, I need to go back here. One of the things that happened in the 1980s is that new ideas decided to come up. And as I said earlier, a lot of money was flowing all over the world for cancer research. And this guy here, uh, Professor uh, Mel Graves, was particularly concerned about the problem of, of acute leukemia in developed countries. 
And he came up with the concept that acute, leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia is most likely a heterogeneous disease uh, with various subgroups and each subgroup having a, a different uh, epidemiology. And to be able to approve that, he decided that he was going to carry out uh, a global uh, research program to try to shed some light on the epidemiology of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Uh, now, monoclonal antibodies were just beginning to uh, get onto the market. And, uh, and he happened, he was an immunologist, so he had access to some of these monoclonal antibodies. And what he did was that he invited people from various laboratories all over the world, including my laboratory in Ibadan, invited me. And there were two laboratories in South Africa that uh, got involved. There was one by one, uh, Professor McDougall. I don't know whether she's still alive. I mean, she was in, in Johannesburg. And then there was another, uh, professor in, uh, in Cape Town. In addition, there were certain laboratories that were identified in, in Asia and in South America. To cut a long story short, we all were using the same monoclonal antibodies that were supplied to us by uh, Mel Graves. We all uh, learned how to do uh, cell typing, immunophenotypic characterization of, uh, of uh, acute lymphoblastic uh, cells in the same way, very, very primitive methods. I, I don't want to go into details. And uh, to cut a long story short, the, 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 the end result of this investigation was that Mel Graves observed that the pattern the epidemiology of acute lymphoblastic leukemia was almost the same throughout the world, with the exception of two areas, Nigeria and South Africa. Now, the children of Nigeria and the black children of, of uh, South Africa have had the same epidemiological pattern. Uh, and there was a difference between the black South African children and the white South African children. And all that led to the concept that, uh, that the lifestyle of maybe, you know, dep deprivation that was found in the African children, especially in Nigeria and the black children in South Africa was responsible for the difference. Now, we found that we, we we're able to uh, develop a method of estimating the incidence of acute lymphoblastic leukemia uh, in Ibadan population. And as you can see here, the incidence of acute lymphoblastic leukemia in Nigerian children was only about a third of what was estimated uh, to be the case in the United Kingdom and among Caucasian uh, children. Now, when you looked at the incidence of common acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is a subtype of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the incidence in Nigerian children was only about a, uh, about a tenth, 10% 10 of what was obtained, uh, what, what was being observed in the children of the United Kingdom and, uh, and the US. Whereas when you look at T, ALL, the incidence was the same uh, in all groups that we looked at, Nigeria, the United Kingdom, you know, the US, and African-American children. And uh, so this more or less uh, contributed to the ideas that uh, uh, Mel Gris had that uh, uh, that acute lymphoblastic leukemia is most likely a heterogeneous disease with different epidemiologies. And the ones that, uh, what is, uh, that there is the subtype that is influenced by the lifestyle of people, the lifestyle of uh, 
social de uh, deprivation. So the, the re reduced frequency of acute influenza among children of sub uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is not only due to lack of uh, recognition on the diagnosis, but of uh, pathogenic absence of the disease, uh, which is mostly related to the lifestyle of the people. We took the idea further to look at the pattern of uh, leukemias in the uh, Ibadan population. Now, if you look at this table here, this is CMR here, chronic myelogenous leukemia. This is a disease that is caused by a genetic abnormality that occurs in all peoples of the world. And that is the, uh, uh, the uh, translocation of uh, BCR able, uh, what we've been call calling Philadelphia chromosome in the past. So, the uh, uh, BCA Evo genetic abnormality is the basis of the chronic myeloid structure. So we looked at the incidence of the disease in the various people of, with, of di uh, different lifestyles in, in the Ibada population. And the incidence of the disease was the same regardless of the lifestyle of the people. Unlike Buckus lymphoma, which is which we found to be more frequent among the poor people of, uh, of uh, Ibadan, you know, uh, people living in uh, dense, densely populated uh, uh, middle area of uh, Ibadan City, like that is like it's what is shown here, you know, those who know Ibadan, you know, the areas of Mako, and like for instance here yeah, that these people living in, in a place like this were the people who had Burkitt's lymphoma, whereas people who had acute lymphoblastic leukemia at a higher incidence were the people who were living in a more leafy and uh, uh, more socially developed environment of a pattern. So uh, this more or less kind of uh, contributed to the idea that uh, uh, leukemia, I mean, leukemia uh, and lymphoma subtypes are related to lifestyles, I mean, of the people. Now, in, for, for a long time, uh, from the beginning of the century, people have been wondering whether cancer is related to a virus. And there had been a research for a so-called human cancer virus. Uh, we knew that there was, there have been, you know, animal cancer viruses from, uh, from uh, uh, the beginning of the 1990s. But there was no evidence that there was any uh, leukemia virus in humans until 1979, when this guy here, this is uh, this is Bob uh, Bob Gallo in his laboratory at the National Cancer Institute in uh, in the United States, when he described a disease that was called adult cell leukemia lymphoma, and associated it. Uh, with the virus called the human T cell leukemia virus type 1, which is the, the first human leukemia virus. Now, I had known Bob when I was in the States before I returned to Nigeria. And so he got in contact with me and said, Oh, Chris Williams, come over. Uh, let's discuss this. So I went to the United States to speak with him, and he showed me a picture of a pic the patient that. Uh, had in whom he had isolated HTLV1. That patient was from Florida, this part of the United States. And he had he asked me whether I had ever seen any disease, disease like this in Nigeria. By that time, I had been in Nigeria for about four years, no, for about two years. I was I went to Nigeria in 1978, and he just discovered this disease in 1979. 
And I said, no, I've never seen anything like this. So I went back and said, well, Chris, just look, look out for, 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 for this kind of uh, disease in, in your area. And I did. A few months after I returned to Nigeria, this guy came up to our hospital in Ibadan. And we were able to study him. As I said earlier, I had monoclonal antibodies and the technology to subtype uh, uh, leukemia uh, cells. And we used that technology to show that this guy actually had uh, adult leukemia lymphoma. Now, I took his blood and uh, processed it, and we got some other samples of blood and I mixed everything up in vials, sent the samples to Bob Gallo. And two weeks after I got a call from him saying that Chris, we found the first case of uh, HCLV1 in Africa. So this is how this guy here, who we studied in Nigeria, became the first case of a retroviral disease in Africa. Today, we now know that there is H H uh, HIV in, in, in Africa. HIV is a retroviral disease. Millions and millions now in Africa, but the, this is the very, very first case of, of a retroviral disease described in an African. And after that, other people went on and did, uh, you know, global uh, studies of the uh, distribution of HTLV1 in the world. And you can see that Africa happens to be the main center of HTLV1 uh, 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 infection. And you do see HTLV1 in Western Europe, but these are probably individuals who have traveled from Africa to the, the colonial, you know, masters countries of France, Portugal, England. Now, HTLV1 probably uh, was uh, transferred from Africa, from West Africa, to the Americas through the slave trade, and from there maybe to to uh, South America, and a little bit of it here. Most of the HCF1 problem in America is localized in in uh, Florida area. For some reasons that we don't understand, HTLV1 is also present in Japan at a very high sort of prevalence rate. Why that is so, we don't know. And uh, now we then went on to study the influence of HTLV1 uh, in health and disease in Nigeria. As you can see here, it, this is Ibadan data. Uh, it by the blood donors had a serum prevalence of 11% uh, percent, uh, for HTLV1. And in the general population, we estimated it to be about 14.1%. Uh, now, patients with, a, with a lymphoma with features of adult cell uh, leukemia lymphoma are 100% uh, uh, positive for HTLV1, but when you look at the general population of uh, non ATL, non uh, uh, non HL, I mean, uh, non uh, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, non Burkitt lymphoma, uh, the, the you know, serum prevalence rate is not different from what you find in the general population. So to be able to actually determine whether or not uh, a, a lymphoma type is uh, uh, HTLV1 uh, associated with, well, you have to look for the virus and you have to look for the uh, clinical features of, of the lymphoma you're looking for, uh, uh, for serum calcium and things like that. And the, the morphology, of the disease and the immunophenotypic characterization of the disease. 
Apologies, there's five minutes left. Yep. Now, um, now let's see. I started about 10 minutes later than I should have, actually, but I hope you give me a little bit of more time. Uh, now, HDLV1 does not only uh, cause lymphoma, it, it does cause a whole variety of diseases, including inflammatory diseases like, uh, uh, you know, the uh, HDLV1 associated myelopathy, TSP, tropical uh, 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 spinal uh, uh, problems, and infectious complications, including things like tuberculosis, leprosy. And so the disease is, uh, the virus is probably responsible for a lot of pathology in, in the general population. And people have to look out for this. Most of this information actually is, is from Japan, uh, which, uh, where they also have HTLV-1 problem. Uh, so there's a need for more work to be done in Africa to find out what the HTLV-1 is doing actually to the population of Africans. Now, now clinical trials, as I said earlier, the, one of the reasons why EOTIC was created was to bring back the excellence of uh, cancer research in the past. And so we decided to, uh, you know, begin to look at uh, 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 cancer problems, especially hepatoma, which is a very common disease in Africa, uh, to try to find out whether some clinical trials could be done to improve the management of the disease. So uh, the first study that was, that was carry, carried out by AOTIC uh, is one referred to as the AOTIC protocol 81 slash 1. Uh, which was carried out by one aortic study group. Now that group was led by James Holland, who was a uh, uh, the chairman of the acute leukemia uh, group B in in New York, and uh, he carried out this study of uh, uh, doxorubicin versus uh, epirubicin. Now, why doxorubicin? Doxorubicin happened to have been a a, a drug that was studied by Charles Horwani in uh, hepatoma, and Charles was able to show that there was uh, some efficacy uh, of that drug in the management of, uh, uh, of hepatomas. And for a long time, the only drug that was used all over the world for the management of hepatoma was, uh, was doxorubicin. Now, epirubicin is a, a drug that is closely related to uh, uh, doxorubicin, and hence the, the study to compare the efficacy of the two drugs. Now, doxorubicin was being produced by a drug firm called Pharma Italia, and Pharma Italia decided to fund this uh, program in which we compared uh, the efficacy of doxorubicin versus epirubicin. Uh, now, this was an international study carried out in between, uh, uh, when was it? Uh, I think 1985 and 1990 in Africa, involving five centers, the five centers I mentioned here. Uh, Zimbabwe, Uganda, uh, Ivory Coast, Senegal, and Congo Brazzaville. And in spite of the poor communication that was uh, prevalent at that time, we're talking about countries thousands of miles away. There was no internet, there was no email. All that was available was telegraphy. In spite of that, it was possible to carry out this study. Now, it turned out to have been a negative study because there was actually no difference between doxorubicin and epirubicin in the long run. But the most important thing about this study is whether it was able to be carried out in spite of the very poor communication of the time. 
When I got to Ibadan in 1978, the survival in Berkeley's lymphoma was, uh, with one year survival was close to zero. And, uh, and I had been aware of what was going on in, in East Africa. Now what Nigerians were doing at the time I got to Ibadan was that they were treating Berkeley's lymphoma with a single agent, cyclophosphamide. And they were not giving uh, intrathecal metoprexate or anything for CNS prophylaxis. And so what we did was to introduce a combination therapy, three drug combination, including being Christian, cyclophosphamide, either metotrexate or cytosinabinocyte. After a few years, we decided to look at what kind of results we were observing. We observed that patients who were adequately treated actually did very well but, you know, many of them were, uh, had a year survival of about 50% in you know, overall survival. Those who were properly treated actually had overall survival of almost 70%. We found, we observed that the, the, the degree of management of central nervous disease was very, very critical to get a better result. And this was what led to uh, uh, a phase two study that we carried out, uh, looking at the possible efficacy of high dose cytosinabinocyte. This was a randomized phase two trial that we did in the bottom. Very, very primitive study. And we randomized uh, individuals to, uh, to uh, regimen one or regimen two. Regimen two was a standard treatment regimen using standard doses of cyclophosphamide, such as nabinocyte uh, and uh, then question, including uh, intrathecal administration of uh, cytosinabinocyte, whereas the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, experimental N was using high dose of cytosinabinocyte almost uh, about 20 times the standard dose of uh, uh, cytosinabinocyte we were given about one gram of, of, uh, of uh, cytosinabinocyte in four doses in cycles two and three of uh, four treatment cycles. To cut a long story short, the, the result of that investigation is shown here. Those who received the standard treatment regimen did as poorly as they used to do as what you see out here. Just about 20% uh, overall survival, whereas those who received high dose uh, cytosine did much better with almost 70% uh, overall survival. This is an analysis looking at the, uh, the population that we studied. And you can see that, but well, this was a very, a relatively small study. We wanted to study 30 patients on each arm, but I had, you know, after some time I had to leave uh, the this, this center. At the time I, I left the center, only about a total of 30 what, uh, patients had been studied, 14 on one on, in uh, the experimental arm and 16 on the, uh, uh, the uh, standard arm. And you can see here that there was a fairly well-balanced uh, uh, distribution in terms of uh, the demography of uh, the cases. Now we then looked at the uh, median dose intensity of the agents that were used. The only difference in the analysis here is the, the, the dose intensity of, of, uh, uh, of cytosinabinocyte that was given. I think, and you can see that here, and that was associated with these results here. About 100% response rate for in, uh, in the experimental arm as compared to 42% in the uh, control arm. And uh, so we attribute this outcome to the effect of the high dose, uh, with those, I mean, high dose, uh, certain, uh, 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 
in the side of the experiment, but it's a, it's a very, very small study, which we did back in 1985. For some reasons, nobody has you know, you know, repeated this as experiment to disprove it or to confirm it. So this is something that I believe that somebody needs to take on and look at again. And this is uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We treated uh, Nigerian children just like you would treat children elsewhere uh, in the developed countries using vincristin, uh, uh, prednisone, and uh, I think we used uh, donorubicin or doxorubicin, three drug combination. The only thing that we did not give to Nigerian children at the time that we, we treated them between 1970 and 1982 was uh, we didn't have elasparaginis, which was a very critical drug. Uh, and there was no radiation therapy for cranial irradiation, for a prophylactic cranial irradiation. But the outcome of this, was that in spite of the fact that we believe that patients were adequately treated with their available drugs, the outcome was very uh, unsatisfactory as compared to uh, what is happening elsewhere in the world. So the management outcome in acute lymphoblastic anemia in African children and young adults in terms of response to a standard regimen uh, as compared to what is uh, seen in development was unsatisfactory. And the observation appears to apply mainly to developing countries, not only uh, of Africa, but also Asia and probably also uh, South America. Uh, the reason for this is not known, but most likely it is uh, due to a different biology of the disease. Uh, as, again, going back to the concept we are from, uh, my graves that we discussed earlier. So the management uh, challenges of this are, are best addressed uh, in the settings of clinical trials. And that is what we're trying to do in AOTCHAC. And uh, uh, Professor Drosimi will be discussing with you the plan that we have, you know, to develop a, a more effective treatment regimen for the management of active lymphoplastic leukemia. And so in conclusion, cancer scientists and yeah, caregivers working in Africa in the past five, five to six decades have made a uh, significant contribution locally and globally uh, using very limited uh, resources. Uh, I believe that the present generation of cancer scientists and you know, caregivers in the region uh, who are better uh, placed uh, with all the uh, available technology of today, including better communications, uh, they probably could do a lot better than what we did in the past. Uh, that is why we have uh, chosen to have this uh, uh, webinar series where we hopefully will be able to meet uh, one another uh, virtually and remotely and develop the ch challenges of management of, uh, of uh, hematological malignancies. And every member of the other job is encouraged to bring forward uh, ideas for clinical trials. And those who are not members of the are encouraged to try to, 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 to join us and give us uh, provocative uh, questions, uh, whatever you may want to, do to discuss, and uh, we'll do the best we can to. Uh, so uh, uh, with that, I would like to end my presentation uh, making this recommendation here. I would suggest that those of you who can afford to buy this book uh, for your own private use that should do so. Most of what I've discussed with you today are in my books, uh, which were published in January last year. And, um, and you can also uh, maybe ask your uh, librarians to get copies of this the book for your library. Okay, thank you. And I will appreciate uh, 
whatever questions you have for me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for that very informative talk. I've had a look at the chat box. I don't see any questions from our participants yet, mm -hmm. but possibly they will put in some questions after our next present at the end of the, um, towards the end of the webinar. At the moment, right. I don't see anything there. So I would uh, stop sharing. Thank you. Okay. The next presenter will be uh, Professor Durasimi. Professor Muhi Durasimi is a board certified professor of hematology. He's a member of the Consultative Committee on National Cancer Control Fellows, Control, and he's also a fellow of INCTR, URCC, Commonwealth Medical Fellow, and a number of other institutions. He has held various positions from lecturer, dean of faculty, head of hematology, foundation chairman of the hospitals and university, chairman of various committees, chief examiner in laboratory medicine, and president of the Nigerian Society for Hematology and Blood Transfusion. He has been coordinating the Novartis Innovative Glivec International Patient Assistance Program, GIBAP, in Nigeria since 2003. He is a long-standing member of AOTIC, and we welcome you to give your presentation now. Thank you, Dr. Jirinsimi. And I thank you for attending this webinar meeting, which is to discuss our proposal on protocol for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, family doctor in Nigerian children and young adults with 30 years and above and below, please. The motivation for this study came at the 2009 meeting of EOTIC in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, when it was realized that outcome of therapy for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a potentially curable disease, is subnormal in most of sub-Saharan African countries. We took up the challenge and we chose to look at the MCP 841 protocol, modified with BFM 90, This protocol has high dose methotrexate replaced with the less aggressive capizzi methotrexate. So thus avoiding the use of lecovolin factor and the complications of high dose methotrexate. The high dose RAC in this protocol it's also limited to just one gram per meter square 12 hourly on this one, 15 and 29. This is to reduce the side effects of this drug and also avoid the use of GCSF. So we, con this, we believe that the toxicity of this drug will be acceptable to our patients. And the drug itself, the intensity will take care of the mainly aggressive ALL prevalent in our population. We have two centers, the Awolowo University Teaching Hospital in Ileife and the University College Hospital Ibadan. So two departments, hematology and pediatric, of both institutions are, pa are participants. By way of introduction, acute lymphoblastic leukemia 
is a potentially curable hematologic cancer that occurs in 70% of cases in children and adults. In, as, in children and adolescents, sorry, it has variable prognosis and response to therapy. However, among the Blacks at home and in diaspora, outcome of therapy is, has not been very rewarding. In 1978, for example, at St. Jude's children, the St. Jude's children hospital workers observed inferior response of 46 American Black children to standard AL therapy compared to 288 Caucasian children with complete remission rates of 74% versus 92%, and median survival of 14 months versus 23 months, p-value of 0 0.001 and 0 0.01 in blocks and Caucasian respectively. Poor outcome of the disease was also noticed between whites. So the survival advantage of white children over black children was again confirmed in 1995 using standard regimen with a five year overall survival of 57.1% versus in white versus 34.4% in black value of 0 0.001. In Nigeria, between 1982 and 1986, using standard acute lymphoblastic leukemia regimen, as used previously in U as used in USA, Ibadan group, headed by CKO Williams, who is present here with us study children and adolescents under age 21 years. No significant differences were confirmed between children with favorable age group, that is age two to seven years, and those with unfavorable age group, age less than two, compared to age greater than seven years as diagnosis in complete remission rate, median duration of complete remission rate, and overall survival. This slide, which we saw earlier, using standard therapy again, showed that remission and survival durations were consistent with quality of therapy, either adequate or inadequate. Adequate therapy means those set of students, I mean of, of uh, patients that had complete treatment regimen with all drugs supplied. While inadequate therapy in the case, those treatments, the treatment that involve our patient with some of the drugs missing because the parents were unable to supply the medications. However, whether adequate or inadequate, the treatment fell short of similar results using similar regimen in USA. The adverse acute lymphoplastic leukemia prognostic factors identified in black populations include unfavorable disease biology, unhealthy lifestyles, hostile environmental condition, in particular poverty, hyperleukocytosis, Philadelphia chromosome positive cells um, disease,
comma, AL negativity, T cell tumors, age less than two, and greater than seven years at presentation. However, in 1995, also at the St. Jude's Children's Hospital in USA, now using therapy, high-grade high therapy, for both black and white. The trial confirmed very good treatment outcome for both group of children, despite the higher incidence of eye rate disease in black children. The five-year event-free and overall survival were over 80% for both groups and the 10-year survival results were comparable. This showed that using risk-adapted treatment regimen, our patients can also do very well in spite of their high-risk tumor, further confirming, justifying our, the trial the choice of this trial, of this regimen in our patients. What are the objectives of this study? It's to develop a standardized acute lymphoblastic leukemia treatment protocol for sub-Saharan African children and young adults that will facilitate response comparison across the population to determine complete remission rates and times to achievement of complete remission in patients on the regimen. To determine survival rates among patients on the protocol, overall survival, event-free survival, disease-free survival, and five-year survival. To identify prognostic factors in the participants and to assess the practicality of multicenter clinical trial of a potentially curable hematologic malignancy in sub saharan Africa as a means of promoting innovative collaborative clinical cancer research in the sub-region. Methodology. Diagnosis shall be based on complete examination of peripheral blood and bone marrow cells in a patient presenting with signs and symptoms of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but with at least blood count of 20% or more in bone marrow or peripheral blood. Lymphoid and myeloid differentiation shall be evaluated with cytochemical staining, including PAS, Sudan Black B, and or myeloperoxidase. According flow cytometry shall be used for characterization of leukemic cells with the following primary antibodies, that is anti-CD10, CD19, CD22, CD79A, CD20, surface immunoglobulin, CD3 or CD2, CD13, CD3, CD34, CD45, HLADR, and anti TDT. The patient shall have shall be subdivided into three major risk groups. We have the standard risk, which defines patients who, after on day eight, after seven 
day dose of salt therapy with prednisolone, the total peripheral blast count shall be less than 1,000 per microliter. Intermediate risk groups are standard risk patients who are aged 10 years or more, or patients with white cell count in excess of 50,000 per microliter, but less than 100,000 at presentation. Why the high risk? are prednisolone, poor prednisolone responders. That is, despite salt therapy of prednisolone for the first seven days, peripheral blast counts on day eight is still in excess of 1,000 per microliter and or patients with leukocyte count in excess of 100,000 per microliter. Individuals with Philadelphia chromosome or BCR ABL positive ALL and T cell ALL. We will, however, subgroup the high risk group, that is, into pH positive and pH negative, because the Philadelphia chromosome high risk groups shall also be treated, shall, be, shall have added to their therapy imatinib, which is available free in Nigeria, courtesy of Novartis Pharma. Patients shall also be assigned to one of five socioeconomic groups according to the level of education, profession, and economic status of the parents or guardians. We will also stratify patients into two broad groups those aged less than 15 years and patients 15 years and above at presentation. Protocol design. The following patients shall be enrolled into the study, consenting treatment naive patient with primary acute lymphoblastic leukemia within the age bracket one to 30 years or less at presentation, an estimated survival of at least three months and or a COG score, prognostic score of two or less. The following shall not be enrolled previously treated patients. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia secondary to chronic myelocytic leukemia transformation. Fab L3 morphology and our service immunoglobulin positive BALL. Of course, we will not enroll pregnant and nursing mothers. Patients, their parents or guardians shall also be properly counseled. Why we will seek the assent, we will obtain assent from the minors. Counseling shall involve explaining to them the nature of the disease, financial implications of therapy, Details of treatment and duration. We will also discuss adverse, possible adverse effects of treatment. 
The primary endpoints of the study are achievements of complete remission and time to achievement of complete remission. And secondary endpoints are disease relapse, frequency of adverse events, event-free survival, disease-free survival, overall survival, and five-year survival rates. Treatment plan. Remission induction shall last for 20 weeks, including induction, induction one, induction two A, induction two B, and repeat of induction one. And this will be followed immediately by the mission consolidation lasting four weeks. During therapy, subsequent treatment shall be given with ANC greater than 1,000 per microliter and platelet greater than 75,000 per microliter. Complete remission rate shall be defined as absolute neutrophil counts in, in over 1,000 per microliter, placelet count 75,000 per microliter or, or and above, zero blast count in the peripheral blood, bone marrow blast 5% or less. There, will be, there should be no extra medullary disease. Remission maintenance shall last for 72 weeks for BALL and 96 weeks for TALL. Standard risk and intermediate risk patient shall have the same treatment protocol. During induction 2B, all the patients shall have five doses of Capizzi metotrexate regimen. As I've said earlier, this may not require the covalent factor. Um, we also, you will also have taken care of the severe complication of high dose methotrexate. So we will start at a dose of 100 milligram per meter square, and this will be escalated by 50 milligram per meter square every 10 days, day one, day 11, 21, 31, and 41. From day eight of induction one therapy, at repeat induction one, and all through the maintenance phase, dexamethasone shall replace prednisolone for high risk patients. This is because dexamethasone crossing is more effective for intrathecal therapy because it crosses the blood barrier. Although toxicity can be a problem, we will take care of this. High dose cytarabine shall be given at a dose of one gram per meter square on this one 15 and 29 for iris patients only during induction 2A. This is to reduce the complications of the drug and also to avoid the cost of prophylactic GCSF, which will add to the cost of treatment. Triple, triple intrathecal therapy comprising methotrexate, cytarabine, and corticosteroid shall be used all through induction one, induction 2A, induction 2B, 
repeat of induction one and consolidation phases for high risk patients only, as against only intrathecal methotrexate for standard risk and intermediate risk patients. I've already defined complete transmission. No respondent are patients with bone marrow blast greater than 5% at the end of induction 2A. non evaluable patients are those who die before marrow was assessment during induction one. So we take this as induction mortality. Relapse occurs when there is presence of blast in the marrow or peripheral blood in 20% or more. Or the presence of histologically or cytologically confirmed extramedullary leukemic cells, especially in the, in the CSF, testicle, skin, and eyes, after initial achievement of complete remission. Criteria for off study. This will include patients that voluntarily withdraw. Such patients shall be followed up for deceased survivor, deceased free survival, and overall survival. Individual who present with persistent life threatening multiple organ failure shall be followed up till death. Failure to achieve complete remission, even at the end of repeat induction one, shall be followed up for overall survival. However, we will also switch, switch to any other regimen outside the study. This will also go for the last patient. We will switch to any other study, any other treatment other than the study by following them up for overall survival. What are the challenges of this study? I think it's the cost. In local currency, the total package will cost of over 252 million naira or well, $648,000. Broken into clinical trial and of course institutional charges. The clinical trial on its own will cost $580,000, including medications, which is the lion's share, 71%. Equipment, about 9%. Hospitalization, 16%. Investigations, just about 4%. Of course, we, we have also included on, in the clinical trial, the cost of conferences and meetings and sundry expenses for the two centers. Indeed, the average, the cost of treating a single patient in local currency is over 2 million naira, or 5.250, 5,250 dollars per patient. 77.6% of the cost. 
medications alone cost more than 70% of the cost. Unfortunately, insurance coverage is not available. So this makes it too expensive for parents. I think from our investigations, treatment of acute lymphoblastic leukemia is not cheap anywhere. In the rich African West standard, to treat a patient with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, it will cost about a hundred thousand dollars. <throat> this will probably include the cost of stem cell therapy. In the developing countries, in China, for example, about $11,000. In Iran, a little over $6,000. In Bangladesh, $4.4,000 US dollars. These are comparable to what we have in Nigeria. In effect, we can say that treatment of acute lymphoblastic leukemia is beyond the reach of most Nigerians. And this explains the study, this study, and why we have not been able to get funding locally at the highest level. I should like to thank the EOTIC group, Sky Wilson, Ben Mera, and also my co-researchers at both ends, that is in UCH and if you're here, thank you for your kind attention. Okay. Thank you, Professor Durinsimi, for your very informative talk. Dr. Williams, we have a question from one of our participants. Okay. I don't know if you can see the chat or I can read it out for you. Uh, you will. Okay, you can read. Are you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Shall I read okay. it to you? Well, are you talking about the question from Anthony? Anthony Oye, 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 Oye. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I have it here. So, uh, okay. uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Okay. Uh, Dr. Okay. Uh, Dr. Okay. Oye Kone, who is a member of uh, the track is asking, says, uh, uh, I'm particularly interested in the a ALL study where the outcome was unfavorable but this outcome was linked to disease biology rather than to the absence of uh, ALS pyrogenes. And my question is whether the absence of this uh, other the therapeutic options may ha have been responsible for the outcome. And the answer to that is probably yes. Uh, but I, I still feel that in spite of that, I, I, I mean, one would not be able to say exactly uh, whether, you know, the absence of ALAS brightness might have been due to the problem. However, I'm not too sure about the role of our absence of cranial irradiation, prophylactic cranial irradiation. Uh, the reason being that uh, the, uh, the patients that failed did not fail because of the central nervous system uh, uh, relapse. Uh, so I'm not too sure about uh, the role of absence of cranial irradiation. Uh, but uh, the, the point is well taken that the absence of ALS brightness could have contributed uh, uh, in some ways. But the, my overall impression is that the biology of the disease was 
uh, so, uh, 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 is probably what is responsible. And I think that is borne out by uh, the, uh, 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 Dr. Drossi in presentation, uh, showing the difference in resp treatment response between uh, black American children as compared to Caucasian American children. I still feel that that difference is most likely due to differences in lifestyle induced biologies of the diseases uh, rather because they were treated the same way. They, everybody got their asparaginus uh, from the uh, uh, Dr. Rosemary's presentation. So, I, I, and it was very interesting that when everybody uh, got treated with a treat, another treatment regimen with higher dose uh, uh, in intensity or maybe uh, different combinations of drugs, everybody uh, did fairly well. So, the, the, the bottom line is that the standard treatment regimen being used uh, in the, uh, at the time that we studied our patients, uh, the sanitary and being used in the West was just not appropriate and not intensive enough. And that was because of, uh, of uh, a, a different biology. That, that would be my uh, explanation. Um, uh, and I'm not too sure that the absence of cranial radiation uh, had any role to play. That's, uh, is, anybody else has any questions about that? Any questions can be typed in the chat box. Is, is there any way uh, 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 I can get a feedback from Dr. Oyekunle? I will see if Dr. Oyekunle is still on. Okay. May I ask a question to uh, Dr. Drosimi? Yes, you may. <laughs> Good. Okay. Listen, I, I, I very much I enjoyed the presentation. I, I have a number of questions. Now, I, uh, I noticed that you plan to use high dose cytosinarabine or uh, cytarabine uh, in, in the management of your patients. And that you would be using uh, GCSF gastrin uh, as uh, to prevent infection. Also, I also noticed that the dose intensity of your high dose of uh, cytosinabine is not it's not likely to be as high as what we 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 had in uh, in in the. Uh, uh, limited lymphoma, yes, phase two study. So the, 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 the disease should not make a difference. The, 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 uh, the dose intensity is what determines whether or not you need, uh, uh, you know, hemopoietic uh, support. So I, I'm not. I'm not too sure. Now, my question is: Has anybody actually done a phase two trial of the dose that you're going to use, with or without your gastrin, to determine whether actually you need to use G GCSF or not? It would seem to me that you know that people have become very nervous about this. We did this study back in the '80s, and uh, and. The patients were given one gram per meter squared of cytosinabinocyte 12 early times four doses per cycle. That, that is about four or five times more intensive than, than what you plan to do. And in spite of that, I cannot remember that anybody actually had uh, all that troublesome uh, uh, evidence of bomar failure. So I, 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 I don't know. Has anybody done any, uh, you know, clinical trials? I mean, any, a phase two trial to determine the need for or for, for GCSF or not? Sorry, 
we reduce, we have the use of high dose cytarabine is really not new to us because in some patients with lymphoma, refractory lymphoma, we've used standard high dose therapy, high dose cytarabine, mm -hmm. but we did not go beyond two gram per meter square, this one to four. For each cycle. Two gram or one gram? Two gram. I'm talking two gram. Okay. Two gram per meter square, this one to four. But we always add GCSF. Right, because if you, 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 you feel that they, they, if you did not, they yes. will be in Don't want to take a risk. You know, there you go. Now, at yeah. the time we did our study, there was yeah, no I GCSF. read your paper on it. There was no GCSF, and nobody had any problem. I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, this is what I'm saying. I, I think you need to have a phase two trial to be able to actually, you, you, uh, this is where clinical trials you know, become uh, uh, important. You know, you have to be courageous to say that this is what we're going to do. We want to see whether or not we need to see yourself. And, uh, and, you know, from what you're saying, now you're given yeah. two per meter squared up per 24 hours, right? Yes. Uh, no, two gram yeah. per meter square. Yes. 12 hourly, this one to four. Oh, 12 hourly. Yes. Well, that, that's a lot of drug. 12 but hourly. That is much more than what we did. We used one gram per meter squared, 12 hourly, for four doses. You say, why did we do it that way? The reason why we did it that way is, first of all, we had a very limited amount of drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, 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 I would have wanted something a little bit more intensive. But even at that dose, we, we, we did not have any. But if you're using two grams per meter squared, I agree, you, you may get into trouble and you may need to. But on the other, all the same, I, I still think that you need to to be able to support what you're doing by clinical trials results. And so that we've done this, and those, those who did not have GCSF, this is what happens to them. I mean, you can hold back your GCSF and do the trial and then use the GCSF to rescue the patients rather than be giving them a GCSF routinely to prevent infection. So what you are trying to do here mm -hmm. is to use only one gram per meter square without GCSF. Yeah. Okay. That That's is. Yeah. That is what we are doing in this particular study. Okay. Okay. One so gram per meter square, twelve hourly. This one. Twelve hourly. And this thirty-nine, twenty-nine without GCSF. Yeah, but you see, you're doing it only one dose. Without GCSF, we, you know, without GCSF, yes. But, but you, I'm just trying to have a clarification. You are not doing uh, uh, one gram per meter squared, twelve hourly times four doses. No. Four consecutive. You're doing one treatment and then followed by another day. Uh, one day. Yeah, with that you would not need GCSF. No, we Sorry? don't need GS GCSF. I'm really sorry to interrupt in this very interesting debate, but we have now come to the end of our two hours. So um, thank you very much to our presenters. And it was a very interesting talk. And uh, I want to invite everybody that's still online to, to join our next webinar, which will be in September. We will send advertise well in, the ta in time of the date and the time for the next webinar. Yeah, good. Okay, thank you very much, Bermuda. Again, the the discussion I was having with uh, Dr. Drusim right now, this is the kind of thing that I, I would like to see in our webinars so that we can discuss remotely or virtually how things are being done and whether we can 
come up with ideas about how things can be, uh, you know, modified as we go along. But uh, I very much enjoyed uh, 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 Dr. Drosimi's presentation, and uh, I will go from there. Thank you. Thanks for. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.